it used to be that data governance was more of a centralized effort uh, where one group decides on policies of access and how data should be controlled um, in order you know, for it to be used correctly. Uh, and I would say it also gotten a more spotlight mainly because of uh, privacy regulations that have come out in uh, the past. Sinji, welcome to the Data Bytes podcast. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thanks for having me, Sadie. Super excited to be here. So you are the founder and CEO of SelectStar, the second company you have founded. Can you tell us a little bit why you decided to found another company and what is the mission of SelectStar? Uh, so I have a computer science background and prior to this, I run a company called Concourse Systems, uh, where we built a distributed stream processing framework. I started Concord in 2014, um, a while ago, and at that time, stream processing uh, was at its infancy, uh, just as a, a um, industry that's being utilized on the commercial sense. Uh, it's also the same uh, year that Confluent was uh, founded. So uh, I, uh, for us, it made sense. Uh, and when uh, we had an opportunity to partner uh, more strategically uh, with much larger company, uh, so I ended up selling the company to Akamai and run their IoT product division, uh, where I was able to uh, primarily uh, partner with uh, global enterprises that wanted to and were already collecting, processing, and storing uh, lots of data, terabytes, exabytes of data. And uh, with that experience, I uh, firsthand noticed that uh, the there's really not much of a bound anymore regarding how much data we're collecting and also variety of data that everyone is collecting. Uh, and it's really helpful to have that all in one place, but the end users of data, data scientists, data analysts, or business stakeholders, they um, kept running into issues because they didn't even know what data uh, they were able to access. Um, the organization overall did not have a good understanding of what are the good data that they can base their decisions on. So these are the areas that I saw an opportunity uh, where there needs to be a better data discovery, uh, being able to find and understand the data that you own and that you have access to. And uh, the reason why I decided to start my second company, uh, SelectStar. So our mission of the company is to make data easy. Data, uh, you know, as a, just a data point or the file, uh, however you want to define it, is in order for you to truly utilize uh, your data, it has to be put into a context. And uh, that is, uh, uh, I believe, what SelectStar really provides to a lot of our customers. So you mentioned that oftentimes data scientists, analysts, who's ever working with the data don't even know what they have available. What is the cost of that? Or is this one of those things that's hard to quantify the cost because it's, it's unknown, right? Or, you know, when, when organizations don't make their data discoverable for those who are using it, what are they missing out on? Yeah, I guess there is a cost of uh, this opportunity because you weren't able to predict it or um, catch it early on. Uh, the other side is the uh, cost that you may incur because your data team might be using the wrong data. Not in the sense of data like values are wrong, I'm talking about uh, that they were confused of whether this was the right table or a column to join on. And this is like a very easy, or I would say easier problem to fix if the knowledge about the data is um, well educated and understood by uh, the data team. And so I would say it's really the first step that you have to take in order to, uh, in order to yeah, start leveraging the data, having that data context and uh, allowing that to be understood by everyone. 
So whose role is it today in an organization when it comes to data discovery and creating the catalog? Well, most of the time it is up to the data team. Depending on the size of the company, uh, this can be a center of excellence or data platform or like a foundation engineering team that supports multiple data analysts or data analytics teams in different divisions. And, um, but there is so much that these centralized teams can also do uh, because the actual end users have sometimes and many times actually have a more context about the data sets that they use day to day. So in a way, it is a, a collaboration effort between the centralized teams and decentralized, uh, like actual end users uh, that needs to put together their uh, knowledge base uh, for everyone else as well. So one of the issues that a lot of people have with data cataloging or data governance just in general is that it oftentimes is just always out of date, right? Businesses are changing, things are continually getting updated and changing. And so it's, it, you know, people stop using it because this information is out of date. One of the things I've noticed about Select Star is it's automated data discovery. So how do you tackle some of those problems of people not using a data catalog or going to a catalog because it always is out of date and it should be the first place that people go? Yeah, one of the things that we pride our, ourselves on is this accuracy and being up to date about your data and metadata. The way that uh, we believe how data catalogs or any of these knowledge base to work is that it is the current state of how your data models or data uh, actually looks like. And in order to do that, uh, we uh, pretty much update the data catalog, we pull uh, pretty frequently, uh, most of the time, uh, at least once a day or several times a day, uh, in order to update any changes that might have happened from the data warehouse or the, the data lake or the BI tools. Uh, the other part, which I feel like is a usually more important or more used within the data catalog, is not just the list of information that the catalog has, but it's really the uh, computed context of that metadata. Uh, Gartner calls this activated metadata. Uh, and what that means is for uh, you to be aware of which are the sources of this data, who are actually utilizing this data, what are the dashboards that were created, uh, how does the lineage look like, um, what's the current like quality or size of the data set, uh, things like that that may change because of there are a lot of data pipeline changes or because it is um, there are uh, jobs that are continuously running underneath, I would say, uh, are the area that uh, needs to be continuously updated. Uh, so what we uh, do uh, underneath also is to propagate any changes or documentation that might have been already written in the past so that it gets applied to any um, like subsequent uh, like newly created tables and uh, columns uh, before you having to manually document the tables and columns. Amazing. That's yes, makes a lot of sense. And then, wh what about in terms of like machine learning models? Is this something that you also would catalog in a system like this, or is this really just for the raw data that would? potentially go in to be used by these models? Yeah, today, a uh, lot of the data sets that we uh, manage are relational data, tabular data, and uh, we do support um, tools like AWS Glue that uh, can uh, uh, be connected to like your S3 buckets. So uh, on, in terms of machine learning purposes, it, if you are uh, feeding uh, data directly from just the file system, uh, you know, that may not be all like catalog, like uh, feature catalogs, uh, but a lot of the times uh, our customers use it for uh, different dimensions or uh, what they would, you know, uh, manage features on, whether that's in their data warehouse or data lake. Uh, but primarily, I would say it's designed for BI tools, a SQL-like uh, 
um, uh, queries that accesses the data. It seems like for organizations, if they don't have a tool like this or not thinking about cataloging their data, now is the time to start, right? Because the amount of data we're creating just from all of the sensors and systems, so many aspects of business are digital. Let alone, we haven't even got into generative AI, which is now creating in a way more data. If companies are, aren't looking at and managing their data today, to me, it looks like the future is kind of bleak for them, right? You're going to, it's going to be really hard to get ahead of the curve. So like, what advice do you have for organizations and how to share that business and value proposition for being able to discover your data? Because I think a lot of people really struggle with like communicating the value proposition of this. They're you know, as a data team, they'd love to have a tool or have automated data discovery, but being able to get the budget and the buy-in sometimes is challenging for the business users to understand. So what advice do you have for individuals in, in that regard? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, Sadie. Um, because I think in the past, this might, that a catalogs might have been treated as, oh, like a productivity tool for the data scientist or data analyst excuse me, or um, more like a inventory software for the database uh, management teams. Uh, whereas today with the vast amount of data applications that you can uh, utilize this on, or even like what you mentioned, Gen AI, uh, it's becoming a lot more important to have this kind of like a data mart or um, a way to summarize and catalog uh, uh, your whole, like what is in your data warehouse so that it can be truly utilized by your uh, next generation applications. And uh, we are starting to see more use cases like this, uh, especially for Gen AI because a lot of LLMs and uh, Gen AI models are uh, really great at understanding uh, just text. At the same time, the real valuable information for a lot of organizations are in a tabular format. So uh, in that regards, uh, being able to have this understanding through metadata and direct which models uh, should leverage a, a, the, how the models could leverage which data sets that's residing in the company warehouse or data warehouse or data lake is going to be uh, become more critical for uh, these uh, models and new applications to perform as expected or at the quality uh, that you want to drive for because it's you know otherwise garbage in garbage out yes. <laughs> No, I uh, I think a lot of people are um, who listen to this podcast are data professionals, and so I think they'll very much relate to what you're saying in regards to garbage in and garbage out. We've seen it time and time again. Um, you know, we mentioned a little bit about generative AI, and we have a lot more data to monitor and maintain. Where do you think the future of data governance and metadata management is headed? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be really exciting uh, starting to add more automation to data governance. It used to be that data governance was more of a centralized effort uh, where one group decides on policies of access and how data should be controlled um, in order you know, for it to be used correctly. Uh, and I would say it also gotten a more spotlight mainly because of uh, privacy regulations that have come out in uh, the past. Whereas with the uh, rise of cloud data warehouses and uh, data democratization in so many companies, uh, this is an area that's becoming a lot more complex uh, in uh, so much so that it's not uh, actually mm, possible or uh, not necessarily applicable for a centralized team to manage, uh, but needs to be uh, collaborated and distributed amongst 
multiple data teams uh, within each domain. And this is why data mesh or data fabric isn't more of the architecture that a lot of companies are adopting. And I would say a lot of that uh, with that type of decentralized ownership of data, uh, the data governance also follows that model. Um, so that's, I would say, one part that I, you know, see more and more this shared ownership of um, data access and also um, um, the way that we manage data. And on top of that, uh, the other part that I see more uh, is with Gen AI, Gen AI and other introduction of uh, more modern tools like Selectstar, uh, you are starting to automate the decisions around access as well as um, documenting uh, and continuing to improve your knowledge base that your data users directly as well as other applications uh, can use. And this is a part that I'm quite excited about where you can now truly um, have workflows and uh, aspects that is not just bounded manually or by a human approval. Uh, there can be the you know logic or um, actual uh, responses that can be built in regarding understanding the actual data uh, usage or purpose and uh, where and how uh, it's being utilized in um, organizations. So that automation piece and the more decentralization uh, piece is uh, where I would say data governance is really heading to. Yes, I am excited about the decentralization piece as well. Do you think we'll get, you mentioned about decentralized for different data teams. Do you think we'll get to a point where business users will also be at a point where they can govern and manage their own data as well? And do you think that's a part of the process of where things are headed? That there's this almost like as the tides rise, all ships rise, right? So like there's this level of data understanding and working with data that now that we have things like chat GPT and LLMs that in everyone is interested in and knows about that it will make the business users more interested in managing their own data as well. Uh, like the even business users within the organizations or like individuals. Yeah. So I think that that really kind of comes down to, uh, you know, where the data is originating and if they are the uh, main owners of data that have like um, generated or, uh, you know, collected the data, then that makes sense. But um, the de one of the parts that I would say is also important around decentralization of data ownership is that having a centralized layer of collaboration. So there is a center of excellence or a foundation team that can um, work with different types of teams in order to institute the right frameworks and processes. And uh, I would say, uh, so it's in a way more of a hybrid model uh, that needs to be instituted. And if that there is a good, I guess, uh, type on that, then I would say, uh, yes, I think eventually the individuals that may have created data sets uh, can uh, basically add it to the main governance. But a lot of the frameworks would have to be driven by the data team still. Yes, definitely. So switching gears a little bit, I'd love to just go into your own personal story of founding a company and what has been your founder's journey? What Did you always know as a kid that you wanted to be a founder and be a CEO and lead a company or when was that aha moment for you? Um, not always. <laughs> so I would say, um, well, so I studied at University of Waterloo in Canada, 
And Waterloo has a really good co-op program that got me uh, to work with, it, with five different companies uh, during uh, my college years. And that really helped me to uh, basically think about and continue to kind of make my own iteration for finding what I really want to do. Um, it didn't necessarily end up in that uh, startup, but what I realized is that I was interested in uh, doing uh, or trying out at least different things because, and the part that I uh, started more rocking towards uh, because I started as an engineer where I was very interested in figuring out how to build things uh, that has shifted towards more on what are we building and defining what to build, but uh, has more uh, evolved eventually to why are we building things and um, what how, and how does business decisions get made. And I think, you know, that kind of like led me into uh, wanting to start something and um, had on, when I first started Concord, that was a really the initial opportunity to uh, work on something new uh, because at the time my CTO really wanted uh, me to help him productizing the technology and bring it to the market. Uh, it's really after um, I sold the company and uh, worked with Akamai for a little bit and I took a break. Uh, when I really thought about what I wanted to do next, um, I, I realized that, you know, starting uh, something from scratch, starting something from the beginning, uh, especially if it's the right opportunity and there is, um, there is a big market that I can go afterwards is something that I wanted to do. And it is something that I am, if anything, you know, the best that uh, compared to any other uh, types of, uh, I guess, quote unquote job I had before. Um, so this is kind of like led me to uh, think that, okay, well, uh, maybe I should just start something again, because by the time uh, when I was uh, taking my sabbatical, I also uh, started advising other startups and uh, investing in angel investing in other startups. And I really liked being an operator, uh, being really hands-on and building things uh, rather than just, uh, you know, giving advice. So I, I would say that's also the reason why I'm back in the founder seat. That makes a lot of sense. I think I tell people some of the best ways to find out what you enjoy doing is find out what you don't enjoy, right? So you try different things and say, okay, I like being in the operator more, role more than the advising role. I'm going to go back into that role. Uh, what What do you hope the future for Select Star looks like then? Now that you are in the operator and the driver's seat role, really? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's really awesome to uh, be building a company again uh, and growing the team here. And I see that this uh, area that we're in right now, like just the data industry in general, it's going to be look quite different in a couple of years. So I'm just really excited uh, like where we would be and how um, we would fit in uh, with the rest of the ecosystem, especially with Gen AI and everything else. Um, so it's really what I'm looking forward uh, for is, um, I mean, I can go into like the specific features and whatnot, but then uh, really how uh, we can like enable uh, not just the data users and uh, empowering data consumers, but uh, more so now towards different applications and businesses that uh, because uh, we can really help leverage the data that you already have. I love it. And then what advice do you have for people who are thinking about starting the company, but kind of on the fence of it? How do you know when you're really ready or when the time's right, or if you have a good idea that's worth chasing? You have to, like, I would say, you know, anyone that, like one advice that I would give to anyone that wants to start a company or has an idea is really just to go out and test your idea. You have to talk to your potential customers. Uh, you have to see how the 
the your own product uh, or uh, yeah, your service is going to look like, how is it going to be uh, different from what exists in the market? Um, and like try to get as much feedback as possible from real users and uh, people that you know could uh, be buying uh, such product. I feel like without that, it's really, um, you know, it, you're kind of like still like living in the dream. Uh, whereas you would want to be um, kind of hit the reality as soon as you can, because um, once you start a company, that's uh, that's a big commitment, and you will have to really go all in. Um, you know, night and day, it's not, it's not going to be the same anymore. <laughs> well, compared to like before you start the company, I think starting a company it just operationally is like so much easier now than before. Uh, but the harder part always is really like truly creating a differentiated product in the market and getting the right distribution for it. But in order for those to happen, you do need to have a um, lot of insight of the industry and the market. And, uh, and you may already have it. Yeah, you may be sitting in a really good idea. Um, the only way to find out is actually not start your company, but rather to talk to and get feedback from uh, people that would or could potentially use it. Yeah, I am so excited about how easy it is to really get started with an idea and even test it, right? I mean, it could you could have a product and open source it and just see like what are people's thoughts on it and get community feedback. The tools and the accessibility that we have now is is really limitless where you don't have to put a lot of money into it and I think you know that on the head though it's the hard part is finding that product market fit and then getting that distribution, right? So while you may have some initial feedback and some initial users, how do you really scale these models to have the impact that you want to have today? Um, seems to be the challenge everyone is trying to figure out. <laughs> Once you start a company, getting to product market fit and getting to the scalable distribution definitely is the next hurdle or next step. And I think for that, um, you know, there are a lot of tactical things you can do, but um, if anything to be considering prior to starting a company uh, would be really thinking about like market shifts and changes that are happening. Because some of the times you don't know or you cannot control or no, no one company can control what's happening in the market. Uh, like when I first started uh, Concord, like my last company, we were too early in the market. Um, and now stream processing is much, much bigger. Uh, but at the time we were early and it's not something that, you know, we would have been able to change. So it's, um, I think, understanding uh, the cycle of the market, where uh, the market is and, you know, how that will play uh, either for or against your uh, specific idea. I think it's also, um, uh, something that you need to uh, keep in mind uh, when you are uh, starting a company or um, raising money. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I just want to say thank you again for taking the time and come to, coming on the podcast and chatting with us. If in, others are interested in finding more about Select Star, how they can do automated data discovery, what's the best place for them to go and find out more? Yeah, um, anyone can check out Select Star at selectstar.com. We have free trial and fully self-service, um, so anybody can start an instance right away. And yeah, it's been great to be on the podcast and talking to you today, Sadie. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for being here. And a big thank you to our listeners. Remember to stay curious and keep learning. And we'll catch you next time on the Data Bytes podcast. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of the Data Bytes podcast. If you're looking for more resources to further your data career or find your tribe, we encourage you to become a member at womenindata.org. See you on the other side.